I came at architecture from painting and drawing. I came from the, from an, uh, an aspiring art student that took uh, uh, very seriously my art A level and so on. And so I saw architecture as an opportunity to draw and uh, d describe buildings uh, that I wanted to have built in, 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 in three dimensions and in, in artistic ways. And that was where I began. My art teacher, Morris McPartland, got me started on landscape painting. And I think landscape, the big picture of landscape, and indeed the landscape of t uh, town, cities, urbanism, has been with me all my life. My art teacher uh, got me a job in an architect's office when I had just finished uh, Form 5, so I was 16 years old. And I worked in, a, in, a, in an architect's office in Eldon Square in Newcastle, and I absolutely loved it. I loved the combination of drawing things and then seeing them built. I thought that was extraordinary. And then you were at the, the, the school at Newcastle yes. University. Who were, were there key teachers there that, that you had a particular impact? I think there were some. There was uh, uh, Harry Booten and uh, Harry Faulkner Brown and uh, so on. But they weren't national figures, and I spent most of the time on my own in the library or or touring. I went I went on lots and lots of European trips with scholarships and uh, what have you. So I generally was fairly much on my own. And at that point, you were pretty interested in technology and materials and and the kind of you know the white the white heat of potential new architecture i was i i saw uh modernism uh, our, our professor at the time had been working for luchens and i saw modernism as a revolutionary alternative way of doing things and so uh, that's what i did but i well it wasn't that i excluded a deep love of older buildings, which I had at that time. I used to go around, the National Trust had only just got going, so I went to see many of the great houses in the north of England. Um, but it culminated in me discovering Bucky Fuller after I'd been in love with Frank Lloyd Wright, and then I found Bucky Fuller. And uh, I always like to, to think I was almost the first in Britain to have discovered Bucky. But I, I think if I'd been in a school where there was a general direction with strong teachers, I wouldn't have been on my own discovering these things. I grew up in Newcastle, my hometown is Newcastle, but my parents, in my, just before my first year, I moved to Blackpool. And uh, my father's job uh, made him uh, then move there. And so I used to work uh, summer holidays in Blackpool, in, in, uh, in, which was a great place to get summer jobs. And I placed my final thesis as a peer out in the sea at the foot of Blackpool Tower uh, and out to sea. And I based it on Bucky Fuller and I was, I was then probably ahead of anybody on Bucky Fuller in this country. <laughs> now that American influence was then extended but in a quite different way because you got a scholarship to go to the States and this is really where you started to get acquainted with ideas about urbanism, town planning, and the city. It was true. I, it did change me intellectually. Um, it, was a, it was an interesting interlude because I came back and taught at the AA and went into partnership with Grimshaw. And in a way, the American experience settled to the back of my mind, but it was extremely important to me at that time. Uh, there was uh, a complete flowering of pop art, uh, which uh, in New York and Philadelphia. Uh, there was Bob Venturi, who I got to know personally, and he was writing Complexity and Contradiction. Uh, there was Ian McHarg, who was a great influence on ecology and landscape. And the books that I remember reading at that time were uh, Jane Jacobs, Life and Death, and also books like Rachel Carson, uh, which all settled in the back of my mind, but when the 70s began, um, it all came forefront and it became very much post, uh, part of the post-modernism uh, in the intellectual sense uh, movement of the mid-70s. There was a, a sort of interesting moment when 
Farrell Grimshaw that were renowned for doing, you know, what we think of as, as high tech buildings, um, nicely engineered, a variety of building types, but tending towards a shed aesthetic. Um, but at the same time, you were getting interested in actually what one could do with existing stock and existing pieces of city. And this led to um, a, an article that you, that you wrote for the RIBA journal, which, was, which introduced this idea of harvesting or nurturing the built environment, almost in an agricultural sense. And I wonder, looking back now, whether you saw that as a kind of oppositional thing to the world of high tech, or whether at least at that time that it would be perfectly possible to, to run these two ideas simultaneously of both the new but paying more attention to the existing. Uh, I did a lot of uh, adaptation work uh, in London and I found that absolutely fascinating. So I developed a, uh, an approach and, and, and a strong support of dealing with buildings as a resource, as they are, looking at how I, I use the expression in the lectures and, and in the articles I wrote at the time that buildings are a resource like coal un, under the ground or oil under the sea, that we should be investing uh, in, the, in the cultural continuity, the social continuity, as well as the physical side of it. But there was a, a, a definite attempt to make it connect with uh, the high tech because um, it was published. In fact, we gave we gave lectures when Nick would particularly describe uh, the need to have buildings that were highly flexible, that respond to users, that had a long life. And I would look at what was there. And so we tried to pair the two uh, concepts. The subsequent um, emergence of um, postmodernism in Britain, you were um, the leading architectural exponent. I mean, not least because you, at that time you were doing more buildings than anybody else. But the, the roots of what developed into a series of mm. uh, quite spectacular central London buildings actually go back to a domestic project, uh, the Charles Jenks House, about which much has been written about the relationship between client and architect and where the ideas came from. When you worked on that house, were you uh, conscious that actually you were undergoing an intellectual transformation and that's why the, the house interested you? Or was it working on that house that kind of crystallised ideas in your mind about history and colour and the kind of expressionist, more expressionist world? I found the house did get me into a better dialogue with uh, Charles's intellectual position, but it also at the same time turned me off. Uh, I found the, uh, I, I used to say post-rationalism seems to be more important than post-modernism. And it got me very early on into thinking about post-modernism being an intellectual thing rather than a style thing. It turned me off the style thing. I think the house, particularly uh, the way Charles took it aft on after I had let the owner then decorate it and so on. And, the, and the, the narrative I didn't identify with. I had one narrative and it was overlaid with another. And I thought it was over, overblown and, and over, -ration, over post rationalized. And so I began to look for a different basis. Uh, and I, uh, at the same time, began to get very involved in the urban design group. I became its chairman or president. And I did that for six years and I began to look at alternative schemes uh, 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 and indeed ways of improving London. So I got into um, what would be called, we, we call today activism, which was an urban uh, thing by nature. And indeed, when I got uh, the Charing Cross project and the client who rang me up, Jeffrey Wilson, said, I've been referred to you because I understand you're as much an urbanist as an architect. And I saw urbanism and context and placemaking as really central to the postmodernist argument. And today they are mainstream, even if the style isn't. And I went off the style as a style only quite early. Actually, we don't really talk about postmodern urbanism, do we? 
But we do talk these days about landscape urbanism, yes. um, interestingly enough. Yes. I mean, there have been there have been changes in the way one thinks about um, the nature of the city, but I don't recall anyone ever claiming to be a postmodern urbanist. Uh, for, I keep defining postmodernism in, in a way that isn't a style. I, I, architects always are more interested than style, unfortunately, and um, and they classify postmodernism as just a style. But in other fields, in music, in film, uh, in literature, it is much more broader than a style. Mm. And I like to classify postmodernism in that sense. And indeed, I would say that postmodernism in that sense pr prevailed. And I, I would say that by the early 90s, all architects were postmodernists uh, and that some were trawling the 50s uh, for inspiration, <laughs> like Rem Koolhaas and others, and others were diverging into deconstruction and all kinds of other things. That wasn't what I... I was reacting to the, uh, the functionalist, uh, the form follows function, and function only being the driving force, which uh, I felt was a barren way forward. Now, there's a, a moment, I think, if one's looking back at your buildings, where you can see, if you like, those phases in an architect's work that seem to have, whether it's stylistic or examination of a particular idea, and then things start to change and they start to move on. I think you know you could see this in James Sterling's work, for example. Yes. There were phases. And I remember when we published your building in Edinburgh, which seemed to me at the time to be to mark a point where actually the more explicit and obvious buildings one would have described as postmodern, you know, the MI6 building, um, uh, that there seemed to be some sort of change going on. And I'm wondering whether, in retrospect, that was true, um, whether it was actually the start of a new phase in your thinking. The trouble with the MI6, it got designed much earlier, even though it happened a bit later. And um, that was because it went right back to a 1982 competition. So it was, in a way, influenced by a long gestation period from an earlier era. Earlier era. Uh, I think that the hybrid uh, uh, stylistic stuff was there in the Auburn Gate project, which expressed the steel and the construction of it and indeed in Charing Cross, which was all suspended from the roof and uh, actually won various European Steel Awards for its extraordinary structure and was an expression of structure, albeit in not a functionalist expression. So I'd begun to change. Uh, Edinburgh continued that change. Uh, I think what really finally did integrate, if that's the right word, rather than change, uh, was working overseas. I think that by the time I was working in China and Hong Kong or, uh, and indeed in Korea at that time in the mid-90s, I think that um, it because the market was different, because the people were different, and because the opportunities were much faster and they needed new things. Whereas I think in London and in Britain generally and in Europe generally, I think you, you're, the need is to work with what's there much more. Whereas in, 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 the, in the New World or in, in, the, in the Far East, I think you need to look at, and you have to look at, and indeed uh, everyone for 20 years has looked at the city as a, as a new thing. Now the irony about this is that you've made your reputation in London at that stage before you start expanding internationally with some incredibly carefully considered work, of which I think Ko Min Ching in Covent Garden, a reworking of the existing at incredible subtle scale and a, and a, a modest scale, and employing all those ideas about urbanity and history and fitting in. Suddenly you're, you're faced with extraordinary functional requirements, the transport buildings in Kowloon and elsewhere, where you almost have to revert to a kind of functional analysis because actually the demands from users as much as clients are so immense and you're working in brand new contexts. Now this must have been a rather extraordinary jump to make and I assume that actually like any architect you live for the challenge and actually the fact that it's a completely different sort of challenge and a completely different sort of context 
you just take that as it comes as part of life's rich tapestry. Yes. I've always liked architects that uh, have evolved and changed. I think Frank Lloyd Wright was very interesting where he went from arts and crafts through to uh, to the Guggenheim, which is quite different. And so did Lutyens and so did Jim Sterling. They're three uh, architects I greatly admire. So I'm not frightened to, to be uh, responsive to different uh, uh, contexts and, and uh, contexts in time as well as uh, geography. Um, I still think that what I do in Hong Kong and China shows some continuity with all that kind of thinking. The West Kowloon Station is very urban. It is very layered. It's got, I discovered very quickly that railway stations have a strong axiality. There's the axiality of the train and there is an axiality of the passenger route which runs right at right angles and is centered to it because you want to enter the station in the middle of the platforms. So that organizational diagram led to a certain formal response. And I think others have found that too, even coming from the modernist tradition, find that when you jump scale, you are, yes, it's functionalist, but you're driven very often to organizational diagrams that have a certain amount of formalism. And certainly when you're dealing with uh, contexts that are very urban, you are dealing with uh, very urban complexity. You're not, I mean, very interesting to compare West Kowloon, say, with the contemporary uh, bu uh, building of the Chetlakcock Airport by mm. Norman Foster. One is on a green field made up land from a, a new island and the other is highly uh, embedded in, in Kowloon itself with, a, with 13 and a half million square feet of new building on top of the station. Now this, is, this, this sort of scale um, is, is something that Corb could only have dreamed of. And I mean, yes. it's sort of tempting to see the European architects who've, who've moved to China working in a way which not only would be impossible um, in, in Europe, but even if it was possible, probably wouldn't be desirable. And I wonder whether um, you have any reflections on this difference in scale and whether your biggest projects are, as it were, enlarged versions of smaller projects or whether actually when you start to work at these mega scales, actually you're, you're, you have to think and approach it in a different way, not just for logistical reasons, but because a big thing is not simply a, a, a big version of a small thing, it's a version of a big thing which is completely different. I do like to design things right from the chair right to the horizon. And I, in London, I've not, I have been doing a plan for the whole of the Southeast region as a result of getting into airports and rail systems and so on and extending the Thames Gateway thinking now to the whole of the Southeast. So, I, and I think architects did used to do, do that once. and. Uh, that they are too project-based, in my view, and not enough, um, not enough experimentation, and not enough uh, advocacy of of a of a way forward. I think architects, um, because there are so many great commissions, they they tend to be very project-based. I think the reality is um, something like um, Kowloon and Beijing South have new elements because they're of a scale but they're added on to, they're not instead of, mm. the thinking that uh, I, I've always had. I wrote a, a recent um, book on uh, the city as a tangled bank, taking uh, a, a, the cue from uh, Darwin and his, uh, uh, his book on evolution, uh, which I then said, that uh, is, do, do we make cities by design or by evolution? And I'm very interested in the uh, accretive way of doing things. Uh, to my mind, um, the scaling up can be an accretive thing. If you look at um, Hong Kong, it works both as a big design thing, but also as a set of accretions. The individual buildings of Hong Kong, that isn't the Shanghai Bank, it isn't the, the Bank of China uh, uh, by pay, it isn't those elements you look at. It's the many, many repeats of all this, uh, this other stuff, which collectively is quite astonishing. 
And, and again, if you look at New York, it isn't the landmark buildings. They, they pop up and you know where they are, but it is the general character of the sidewalks and of the accumulation of buildings that make that. And the same as with London. So I do think uh, the city is made up of very, very small moves, but also some big moves. The grid of New York uh, is, is, is critical, but also in Hong Kong, it's the line of the MTR that is crucial because of the mountains you can't build on. So the line of the MTR follows the, uh, 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 the, uh, the harbour edge. And then because MTR did the development as well as the stations, you get these, uh, these nodal points. I think London's character has been set very much by estates, <clears throat> by the, you know, the great estates by very large landownings. And we still see that today. You know, even the King's Cross is a big estate, and so is the Olympic Park. And I think that's the characteristic of London. It's a big tapestry. Whereas Paris is a medieval city, very highly incremental, with an extraordinary superimposed um, houseman uh, pattern on top of it. And it's the juxtaposition of those two that's very interesting. It's the emperor and the medieval city. And do you think that the future of, of London, and to some extent the future of European and American cities in general, um, will be about intensification and densification rather than the model that's been more familiar in the past, which is if you need to house more people, you just expand into the countryside. Do you think we're going to see 21st century urbanism as a century where actually we're more interested in the borders of the city and doing things within it rather than expanding it? Well, all cities, even new ones, begin to be retrofitted. Even Brasilia is being retrofitted, as far as I'm told, and so is Chantigar. And today we're retrofitting Milton Keynes and the shopping centre. All cities eventually even brand new ones built at one period in time, uh, eventually get layered on and layered on and layered on, simply because things change. You know, subway systems get built, or the motor cars invented. You know, London was uh, planned before the motor car. New York uh, was planned when it, it was a real estate uh, uh, pattern to sell sites. There's no way they thought that the sites would actually developed to the density and the height that they did, but they, they proved to be very robust. I think the layering is absolutely fascinating, but so is the first act. My big complaint about uh, architects and urbanism is that we uh, don't recognise the power of the civil engineer and we don't get ahead of that. It's not often thought that that's a creative part of it, where the harbour is, where the airports are. Uh, where the, the, the rail stations are all generally accidentally placed because engineering uh, uh, decision making predates all the town planning and the town planning predates the architecture. I'm in favour of architects coming in and designers coming in at the early stages, not in order to do it, Corbusier style, but in order to join in the doing of it because I think civil engineers have a huge amount of influence, if not the most amount of influence, on these modern cities. We, we talk about the, the, the Shanghai expansions and, the, uh, and, and what's happening all over China. It tends to be the railway engineers, the road engineers, and the drainage and the water supply that dictates the layout very, very strongly. And it's noticeable that in mainland China, rather than pursuing a Hong Kong model of intense development, they're going for a kind of engineer and probably very old fashioned US style of town planning with great setbacks and huge roads and you put the water system in and that sort of determines how everything else works. Yeah, it does and they, they seem hell bent on um, making all the mistakes of the West. They went through a Corbusian period on housing. Uh, they're making uh, big mistakes on car ownership and. Uh, and laying out cities that uh, you have to have a car. Uh, but they're catching up. There's a knowingness about the Chinese and a, a belief in the long term that we perhaps have uh, much to learn from them about thinking long term. 
I mm. think they will get to grips with um, with pollution and and so on uh, uh, pretty quickly. Actually, we went through a terrible period of pollution. Mm. The Clean Air Act clean air, cleaned up London. We still have problems of pollution in in Los Angeles and other cities. I think they will catch up and then start to join in the leadership. But there's no doubt at the moment uh, they are making and repeating a lot of the mistakes that the West made, uh, particularly the car thing and particularly the engineering led thing. Terry, you've worked with many clients, many developers. Developers have increasingly become players rather than just financiers of projects. Um, do you find this surprising or encouraging? Well, I remember a time in the 50s and 60s uh, when developers were seen as the lowest of the low, and maybe that was justified or not, but uh, the state did provide most of the commissions for architects. But scale has changed, uh, for one thing. I think that developers are now become city makers on a big scale, so you get people like Argent developing the whole of King's Cross. I'm acting on Earl's Court, where we're putting up uh, uh, tens of thousand homes, and although common 25,000 homes is going to be done by maybe one or two developers. I think developers um, it, it, it have a lot of fun these days. I think they are highly creative, the best of them are, and they, have, they are seizing the opportunities of scale in a way that the state isn't, architects aren't, I think they are really uh, fascinating to watch, and they, th there's an awful lot of them uh, are architects, in the, uh, are planners, or uh, place curators now in their own right. Uh, there's some bad ones, there's some good ones, but uh, th it needs that kind of scale of response to city make uh, today, and uh, I, I think they, I, I think they are that there are lots of them that are responding at that scale very, very creatively. And actually it's the developers who are doing, who are working at scale, who of course have the wherewithal to give back to the city um, things in terms of planning gain and landscape and public space. Whereas the sort of small individual developer doing the one-off building, there isn't very much scope for, as it were, urban generosity. The bigger the scheme, the worse it could get. But on the other hand, the better it could get because of the of the scale of civic ambition as well as financial ambition. Well, I I, I learned this less these lessons very early on in my uh, working career with, um, for example, Charing Cross Station. We changed the, the gardens. We realigned the road. It was almost the first shared street in in uh, in London because Villiers Street we replanned. The front of the railway we planned. We had projected to double side pedestrian uh, wise the Hungerford Bridge, but that didn't materialise, but was then done by Westminster because it, it got them going on that. We led the Hungerford Bridge right up to the Strand. We had a whole package of other things that the developer did uh, for the area. That got me thinking about how much uh, fun and how much creative uh, uh, power the developer could have. And uh, since then, of course, it's gone on in scale more and more. And I do a lot of master plans and I work public and private sector because railway stations and airports are cities in their own right. And they need uh, a commercial approach. They need uh, the skills of the private sector, but the state is in there as providing some of the key infrastructure. The final question, a huge effort um, from your office and you personally went into the review of UK architecture, which you've carried out for, for the government. Now, this was the, the first study of its sort for, that anybody can remember. And I wonder now that the, the launch is over, things have calmed down, mm. what sort of conclusions you came to about the state of British architecture and whether, having conducted that review, you feel generally optimistic about the generations of architects coming along now, or, or whether you think that actually you found so many fault lines, um, do we have a problem? 
I think it's a question now of adjustment, which is not very radical and uh, very sexy. But we do have, uh, if you look back 50 years, which I spent a lot of time doing when writing it, uh, there was a crudity and an ignorance uh, among architects about what they thought should be done, and particularly among the general public who accepted what architects and what the experts said. Uh, I think the last 50 years has seen a complete transformation of that. Um, the standard of architecture is very, very high indeed. There are so many good architects, uh, particularly centred around capital cities and major nodal points of design, of which London is one. But there are excellent architects we've seen in, uh, in Glasgow, in, in, uh, uh, in Manchester, in Birmingham, and so on. Um, so the standard has gone up, and the standard of the of the uh, the recent qualifiers, particularly uh, the female ones that didn't exist in my day, uh, is exceptionally high. And I th I think that uh, one should have tremendous sense of not optimism. I I don't like the word optimism because it, optimism means you have expectations which won't be realised. <laughs> uh, I think there is a. a there are every reason for confidence in going forward. The biggest issues of today are not about um, are there good architects, are they doing good stuff, it's a quantum thing. In spite of a lot more architects, in spite of the high standard, the amount of stuff that's going on in Britain we see it is that most stuff is sub-average and we should aspire to much much better. But globally there is a um, there, there is city making and building of buildings on a scale the world has never ever seen. Uh, in 1850, we were London, uh, Britain was the first country to be uh, more than 50% urbanised. By 2000, the whole world was urbanised. By 2050, which isn't that far away, we're going to have 70, 80% of the of, of the world's population, which will be far bigger than in 1850 when, when we were urbanised. Uh, that you're going to get billions or of people living in urban situations. And that has resulted in a demand for city making and buildings of a quantum that's beyond anything we've ever had before. And the trouble is, it's not that it's well designed or not well designed. It, it's, going to, it's just that design is going to make very little impact on it all. It's all going to happen to happen chance whether we want it or not because others are joining in and, and the architects and planners have so little influence and join, and they often have themselves to blame. They don't stand up and join in. Uh, we have in Britain recently on the airport debate. Uh, we haven't too much on the, on the high speed debate. We haven't really got involved too much in the, in the housing debate. We leave it to politicians and other people. We actually have a lot to contribute. Those with our training in architecture and planning and engineering, we should get together and we should help lead. Terry Farrell, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.